this is the public interest. I am Elijah Ramsey. A partnership for national unity and David Granger are a bit uh, dissatisfied with the human conditions of our citizens who are living in the upper Demerara Burbies region. Of course, this week on this week's program, we focus on that. And of course, with me is leader of the People's National Congress Reform and leader of the opposition, Brigadier the Honorable David Granger. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. I will come back to you. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Now, this is not the first time you're speaking out about uh, human, the human conditions of our citizens. And unfortunately, sometimes, especially for those of us living in Georgetown, when we talk about the sufferings of our citizens, we more or less, in our minds, we leave it to Georgetown alone. But your issue is with the Upper Demerara Barbies region, sir. First of all, what is your main concern or major concerns with uh, the citizens of that region? What's wrong with life? in the upper Demerara Barbies region? Well, I'm concerned with citizens all over Guyana, but um, the upper Demerara Barbies region is particularly important to Guyana because it touches six other regions. It has borders in six other regions. It's central. It is the rail gateway to the hinterland. That's the only way you can get to Rukunoni. It's the way you get to region eight. Um, it has got huge, I would say, underdeveloped potential, but the people, maybe the region is rich in potential, but the people are poor in the material conditions. And I am particularly concerned about children. I am concerned that um, there are too many dropouts. And there is a, an education problem. There is a health problem. Um, and there is a, more, more than anything else, maybe there is a job problem, an employment problem. And when you have that sort of combination of poor education, poor employment, um, you will get um, social problems. And I think as a result of that, there's been a lot of pressure on the families. And uh, taken as a whole, the citizens, the residents of that region, not Linden alone, the entire region, mm -hmm. including Kukwani, including Aichu, including Kumata, they're not getting um, the quality, they're not enjoying the quality of life to which they're entitled. It's a potentially rich region, but uh, the poverty is pervasive. And I'd like to see um, richer, richer residents, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see greater productivity in that region. Even before we talk about what developing that region can do for the rest of Guyana, and probably some of our neighboring countries, we're in 2014, and it's in 2012, almost two years ago, uh, sometime in 2012, you did uh, put forward a four-point plan, I think it was, that should help to should have helped to develop that region, and you somewhat made that proposal to government. In that four-point plan, since, since then, from 2012 to now, do you see any of your suggestions, recommendations being adopted? Were any of them adopted? Well, the four-point plan came uh, during the, the unrest in Linden, mm -hmm. and it was really a recommendation to deal with the crisis. That is before the shooting occurred. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, even though like four days before the actual shooting, I gave them that advice. I was speaking at a meeting at Lisba. Um, the advice wasn't followed, but I would say that the advice eventually had to be followed. One, um, the government had to introduce certain economic measures. Two, the government had to sit down and speak with the region because they made it clear that the region uh, was capable of articulating its own problems. Um, as far as the electricity tariff is concerned, the government um, put a hold on that instead of introducing it. And the government agreed to a menu of measures, you know, including the provision of um, television and other, you know, the dust problem and other things that the residents of Linden particularly had spoken about. Uh, that is now subject of uh, an agreement which was signed on the 21st of August um, in 2012. And uh, the agreement has not been fulfilled by the government, and we'll hear more about that. But um, what I'm asking for now is not a plan for Linden, but for the entire region. Mm -hmm. This involves agricultural development of the intermediate savannas, and there's great potential for cattle rearing, there's great potential for citrus uh, and nut production. I'm, I'm calling for um, a rehabilitation of the education system. And we have to understand that Linden 
and the region, um, well, the region as a whole lies between two rivers, the Burmese River and the Dermara River. And there are people living along those rivers. It, it's really a riverine community. It's not just bush and hinterlands, a riverine community. But people cannot, the farmers cannot get their products to the market if there's no boat. Mm -hmm. And the children sometimes cannot go to school. The infrastructure is very poor, particularly between um, Linden, Aichoni, Aichoni, uh, Kokwani. And if the infrastructure is poor, it means that people can go about their day to day business normally. Minibus fares are, are higher, and the cost of repairs to the minibus um, have been increasing. And in addition to that, it just takes much longer. To, you know, what should take an hour or two starts to take four hours. So the underdevelopment of the region, for which the government is, but I hold the government, the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration is responsible for the underdevelopment of that region. Um, whether they are political motivations or not is another matter, but as a result of the government's attitude, we do not see the, the sort of quality of life. We do not see a high standard of living. And in fact, the cost of living is rising. Let me tell you something very, it may seem very um, ridiculous. If somebody living at Linden wants to go to Mahalia, he or she has to come to Georgetown to join a minibus, to go all the way back, passing through Linden to go to Mahalia, simply because the infrastructure and the transport system is so poor. Sometimes children cannot get to school because of the condition of the roads. So we are calling on the administration, the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration, to take a holistic view of the region. This region is bigger than, the, than Kuwait. <laughs> and it has wealth, it has bauxite wealth, it has other mineral wealth, it has timber, it has tourism potential, it has agriculture potential, it has manufacturing potential. But because of government's attitude, you know, we have not been able to see the level and the pace of development which could improve people's lives. What do you believe would be, I mean, I, I don't want to sound too negative or just put entire doom and gloom on the situation, but what are the possible consequences for the people of that community if uh, development does not take place sooner rather than later? Well, we're seeing the consequences now. We have what I call a cycle of hereditary poverty. People are poor. Um, we have poor mothers who cannot provide for their children adequately, either nutritionally or educationally. And those children grow up to be malnourished or undereducated. They drop out of school, and they themselves get children who are poor. So I think we are seeing a cycle of underdevelopment now, and uh, that is the biggest consequence. Um, in addition to that, uh, Many graduates from the schools, uh, private, secondary schools, leave the region. They migrate, they go into the gold fields, or they go to other regions looking for work. So that, at the same time, is depriving um, the region of um, some of its uh, talent, some of its uh, labor force. Okay. I want to talk uh, to some, get to some specifics. And first off, beginning with uh, mining and logging resources. One of the things that, you know, and I, I, I'm sure APN would have raised this already, is the fact that the mining and logging resources in that region over the years would have been exploited. How, if at all, how can we possibly stop that and put things, measures in place so that it would actually benefit the people of that region? Well, when we when use exploit, it doesn't mean um, <laughs> It doesn't mean necessarily in a damaging way. All minerals have to be exploited if um, they are to be made use of. So part of the problem, I won't call it a problem necessarily, the situation in Region 10, in the upper Demara Babis region, is that foreign companies have come in to exploit these minerals. Nothing's wrong with exploitation, but what we are concerned about is that they should pay their dues, their royalties, and their taxes, and they should treat their workers, the citizens of Guyana, properly. And we would like to see, over a period of time, um, indigenous companies being created to exploit these same timber and uh, mineral resources. Uh, we do not feel that, you know, for like for a hundred years, you know, bauxite has been exploited by 
North American companies, now there's a Russian company, Chinese company in that region. So the region is potentially rich, but we have labor problems at, um, at both, uh, mainly in the Russian company. Uh, Russell is the owner of that company, at Arawaima. And um, we, there were some labor problems at both sides, the one in Linden proper. But the Timber, another company has come in by Shanling, um, a Chinese company. But let me make this clear, Malaika. A partnership for national unity supports foreign direct investment. Mm. We support the exploitation of our, our mineral and other resources in a sustainable manner. Mm. But we would like to see um, Guyanese benefiting more. Um, it doesn't mean that there should be less investment, but it should be more equitable treatment of our Guyanese. And we should make sure that there is a regulatory framework and when uh, foreign uh, investors come in the country, they are required to comply and conform to that regulatory framework. So we agree that the minerals must be exploited. There's no point having the bauxite in the ground. Mm. You know, take the bauxite out, but do it in a sustainable manner. We want to ensure that in generations to come, Guyana is not just a series of huge holes in the ground, mm -hmm. but you know, we can see that um, our citizens have benefited from the resources that we've inherited. Right. Apart from bauxite companies and, and, and logging and their other um, mining in that community, what would David Grange and a Partnership for National Unity immediately do to promote the development and uh, improvement of the lives of the citizens in the Upper Demerara Barbish region? The most important immediate challenge is the challenge of poverty. Um, we have to ensure that uh, children going to school have enough to eat, mm. and they have transport to go to school, and that the schools are habitable. Mm. They're sanitary, they have the basic facilities. Um, you know, they're not rotten and leaking, dangerous to life and living. We want an educated population. That is the start. Um, and I think that the poverty level in the entire region is keeping a lot of children out of the school system. Second, um, we need to get jobs. If um, mommy and daddy are unemployed, you know, the tendency is that the children are less likely to go to school, and even if they go to school, they wouldn't do as well. They need to, we need parents who at least can be employed and provide for those children, provide the books, provide the environment within, those, within which those children would, would learn. So we need to get jobs. Um, I think that the efforts to provide employment have not um, borne fruit. So we're looking at um, a twin uh, plan immediately, if you ask the question, one is to rectify the education problems, and second is to rectify the employment problems, and both of those will require um, a head-on uh, challenge, or taking on the challenge of, of poverty. Uh, I think other schemes have been tried before, but we need a plan which ensures that children get back in the classroom and that parents, adults, um, get employment. That is important. As it is now, do you, and, and in your experience and your research, and of course I know you visit that region often, do you see or is there, is there evidence that people are actually leaving the region? The population is more or less stagnant. Um, uh, I've been told the population is about 40,000. The census has not, uh, census results, I'm not aware that the last census results have um, indicated any major variation, but it's unlikely to be more than 50,000 or less than 40,000. Yes, um, it is clear that uh, many persons who used to work, work in the mining industry have gone to Suriname. Mm -hmm. uh, other persons who have been in the services sector have gone overseas, gone to the islands. I've met, I mean, it's a joke that they have every time I go to Linden, Linden to Tungui because a lot of the Lindeners from the diaspora return, I say we throw a stone in the air to land on somebody, the PhD. Hmm. Because um, it's not that Lindeners are lazy or they're, um, they're dumb or stupid, uh, because they do quite well. It means that the way uh, the region is being treated, I would say it, it, in a discriminatory manner, in a discriminatory manner. Because, I mean, 
you cannot develop that region without the major arteries being uh, repaired and brought up to proper national standards. For example, the Lethem Linden Way. That Linden is a hub. And if those two arteries were developed, Lethem Linden and Linden Kokwani, you would see an opening up of agriculture, an opening up of trade, an opening up of other forms of business. So the infrastructure on the development is contributing to the poverty. So yes, I have a lot of hope, I have a lot of faith, but it is clear that people, uh, young, youngsters growing up in there have nothing to do. Why are they being, be going out of the region? As I said, it has borders with six other regions. Yeah. It is, I would say, the most strategically located of all of the regions of there. But because of the poor infrastructure, um, particularly roadways and bridges, we have not seen um, some of the development that we ought to see. All right. Let's talk a bit on, on, on transport. And I'm talking here the, the Barbies River surface that was interrupted. It, should it not have been general knowledge that if that surface uh, is interrupted, that it would affect agriculture and marketing? I, I'm, because, you know, why interfere with it if you know it's going to affect that? If you can shed some light on that. Well, I don't know the reason. Uh, when I was a very young person, I went up to Takama on the Burbis River for the first time, and we went up in a boat, a river boat. And all along the way, you can see that residents depended. They would come out um, to the boat um, to get their mail, mm -hmm. or they would send a lot of their produce, you know, manufactured goods um, from the stores in New Amsterdam or Rosignal would be taken up with them and agricultural produce, uh, plantains and long provisions that would be brought down. And that was the sort of cycle to which people were accustomed. But as the boats um, became older, um, they were not replaced. And we have a situation now in which the Linden Aichuni Kokwani Road has been damaged because a lot of timber and other vehicles use that road. But the road is just really a dirt track. It, it is not a, um, a hard surface. So when the rain falls, there are potholes, and then the potholes get bigger and bigger until they become impassable. And if, in, fact, in fact, a few months ago, there was a strike in which the residents of Aitunia just shut down the road. And the government every year would send a, a scraper, scrape the road, and then the cycle starts. People drive over the road, the rain falls, potholes develop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then next year they send back a scraper. But I do not know why they shut down the riverboat because people are worried not only that they can't get their produce to the markets, it's very expensive for them to travel to Linden um, because to get from Kokwani, instead of going straight through the river to New Amsterdam or Rosignal, they have to go to Aichuni, go to Linden, come to Georgetown. And it probably would cost them maybe about, I don't know, maybe about $8,000. Um, so it's very expensive. But the, the main problem, I think, is that they can't get the produce to the market. And I've been told um, by a senior official in the region that people have been, the farmers have been like, throwing their pumpkins and squash into the river because you know, it's, um, nobody would buy it. Uh, on one occasion, I think they even asked the government official to provide, to help to buy the market, because in the days when People's National Congress had um, had an, um, run the administration, there was something called the Ghana Marketing Corporation, which would buy produce from farmers. But when the farmers asked for a similar um, service, the minister involved um, sent them some businessmen, <laughs> or give them the names of some businessmen, say, contact these people. And that was the end of the matter. So agriculture is depressed because there are no markets. You can't keep producing um, commodities and you don't have markets to sell them in. So the river boat is essential. The same problem, if I can take you out of Region 10, take you to Region 2. Mm -hmm. The same problem exists in the Pamun. The road, the roadway is a river, or the river is the highway. The only way you can get to charity, the only way you can get your children to school is by the river. Similarly, in um, the, for the people in Kukwani, and the, there are other Amerindian communities there, Hururu, and there are about half a dozen Amerindian communities in that region. And the only way they can get to the destinations is by river. 
and the government is not paying attention to that. Interestingly enough, government is not paying attention. I'm going to come back to them specifically. Um, what more can the people of that region do to get improvement? More so, the farmers, because you just talked about their 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 plight, having to dump produce. What more can those people do to get improvement in their region? Well, they have, unfortunately, some of them have migrated, but hmm. we are going to move uh, a little more. Uh, I would say uh, aggressively to ensuring that the representation, there are two regional MPs, uh, Mr. Renis Mori and Ms. Vanessa Kassoon. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to bring those issues um, to the floor of the National Assembly to ensure that matters of education, health, employment, transportation are ventilated and get the government to act on them. We are not a majority that is a partnership for national unity, it's not a majority. But we will continue to ensure that um, the, the uh, issues that affect the lives of the ordinary people in that region are ventilated and we get ministerial action to improve them. All right. I'm sorry to have to go back a bit uh, to mining. In 2007, it was reported that government uh, would be would have been taking measures to ensure that the people of the upper Demerara Barbies region are not solely dependent on mining. I, I know you're not a part of the government, but do you have any idea what happened with that plan? Well, whenever the government is put under the spotlight, whenever it's under pressure, it makes a plan and promulgates a plan. But my information is that that plan was never fully implemented. Um, it is a very ambitious plan, but a plan as a post of proposal suggest that you have actually provided resources and personnel in order to implement the plan. So if, there's, if there are no resources, it's not a plan, it's a proposal. And my information is that the resources were never provided. Um, so it is just a proposal. Uh, it should have been a five-year plan, but that was seven years ago. And it was more or less, I would say, expired without ever being, without ever having been um, satisfactorily implemented. So we're not interested in another um, talking session. We are interested in a real plan that puts people into jobs, puts children into school, and get that region going again. But, but if a, a proper plan, not, not only a plan, proper execution is in place, is it possible for the people of that region to not only have to depend on mining? Yes, that region has vast savannas. Mm. Um, they are rich savannas. In fact, um, in the olden days, when it's older, maybe before you were born, <laughs> cattle would be brought out from the Rupununi through the cattle trail, walking, of course, so it was long. And by the time they got to um, Barbies, you know, there was a lot of um, bread depression, a lot of bone. So they were actually brought to the Barbie savannas to be fattened. <laughs> uh, um, that's where you got the expression beefed up. Mm -hmm. That is the you give them an opportunity to restore the beef, and then they would be brought to the coast where they'd be slaughtered and, and sold as meat. Um, before aircraft uh, were sent to Rupunum, that was the main means of um, bringing um, beef um, to the coast. So, Barbies is important. The upper, upper Barbies, that is the upper Demara Barbies region, is important. You have savannas. Savannas can produce corn, soya, produce. Um, cotton, it can produce um, cattle, it, you know, it can produce citrus products. So the agriculture potential, I would say, is mainly untapped. There's tourism potential because some people uh, would like to see, um, you know, come to the river in areas to do fishing. And right now you see over the last few years, there's something called the Rock Zone Fish Festival. Uh, a lot of people who are serious fishers come in to do that. And then there is um, there are other forested areas, mm -hmm. and of course it's a major what I would call a commercial hub, which allows uh, vehicles to come from uh, Lethem, and a lot of vehicles pass um, through. But uh, because of the poor development of the road, the Linden Lethem road, the poor state of the Linden Lethem road, we don't see the um, the volume of traffic. But if that road was improved to a highway. Um, I think uh, you'd see um, a lot more money coming into Linden. 
So I would say that the region remains potentially rich, but it needs a real plan, and not a bogus plan like the government said it would introduce several years ago, but a real plan that puts emphasis on education, jobs, and of course the, um, the real, uh, alleviation of poverty. You, you mentioned, and of course you're not the first um, uh, public official I heard with this, um, you, you mentioned the, the tourism aspect of it, and I'm, I'm sorry to, if it sounds as though I'm knocking at that too. Um, is Guyana, and, and when I say Guyana, any region, are we really ready for uh, tourism? Are we good enough? Well, we have to start somewhere, and we have the resources. My recommendation is we have the resources to start. Mm. So let us start. I mean, you can't expect that uh, Ghana can be compared with a country like Bahamas mm -hmm. or Barbados, which have had tourism um, as well. The main industry for several decades. They have schools at which uh, uh, staff, you know, staff, hotel staff, and cooking staff, uh, transport staff are trained. And most people you come into contact with in, in those uh, countries, Bahamas, have been trained. They've gone to some school um, to train them to perform the functions. Uh, it is not something you, you can expose amateurs to. So yes, Ghana is, is not ready in terms of having a trained body of um, operators, but Ghana has the resources. And I think that once we give our people the quality of training, and once the enterprises are organized, we can do as well as some of the Caribbean countries because we have a unique product. Okay. Um, you don't find our rivers or vegetation or waterfalls or, or flora and fauna in the Bahamas. <laughs> so as we prepare to pull the curtains down on uh, this edition of the public interest, you did talk about Rusal uh, earlier. Apart from that, even before we get to, the, you, because you spoke about the labor issues, but even before dealing with the labor issues, are there proper laws in place to encourage and probably support other uh, international investors who may want to come and to ensure that they hire people from that region to get the, the job done? Well, like as you know, a partner for National Unity has declared 10 to 14 year for workers. Mm -hmm. Yes, in answer to your question, there are adequate laws. We are calling on the Ministry of Labor and the government of Guyana to ensure those laws are enforced and observed by all uh, uh, companies coming into the country. And a part of the national unity intends to uh, keep its hawk eye on the labor situation. We, well, we welcome foreign direct investment, but we want to protect our workers um, from the sort of unfair exploitation. Mm -hmm. Particularly a lot of women, uh, a lot of single mothers, and we want to make sure that they get fair wages for their fair day's work. Finally, sir, how far? I don't know if this is an issue that can be taken to Parliament because, of course, that's where APN does most of its, its uh, uh, work in terms of um, procedure. How far can this matter of calling for the, the development and the more or less human safety of the citizens in the Upper Demara Barbies region, how far can APN take that? Well, as I said, we are not, um, as a partnership in the majority in the National Assembly, and we are not the government, but we have already started a process in 2014 of calling for a new social contract. We want, we sit down with the unions, we sit down with the private sector, we sit down with the government. If the government doesn't want to come, you know, you can stay out, but we will sit down with our partners. This is what the Constitution calls for. And we are going to hammer out um, solutions to these real problems on the ground. We are not simply going to sit on our hands and see the residents of an entire region being ignored. So we are going to start the process of um, consultation on the basis of um, what we call inclusionary democracy. And we will maintain the objective in the, in the short term, short and middle term, of ensuring that the people of Green can get a good life. Thank you very much, sir. This has been another edition of The Public Interest. I'm Malika Ramsey. We were discussing uh, the development of the Upper Demerara Barbies region, of course, with leader of the People's National Congress Reform and leader of the opposition, Brigadier the Honorable David Granger. Until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>